chapter 1. We looked at the first couple of verses uh, last Thursday night, and so we're picking up tonight in verse 3. And let me again just remind you of the kind of the context of this epistle. It's written in a background of suffering, persecution, difficulty, and it's really, you know, just a a great word of encouragement for people who are going through tough times. And as I I think I mentioned, uh, many times uh, over the years, I have uh, sort of given the assignment to people. You know, somebody comes in and they're just in the midst of all kinds of trials. I will just sort of assign them uh, the book of First Peter. Just, just camp out in First Peter. Just meditate in it over and over again. And you'll find just a, a tremendous uh, richness and just a, a tremendous encouragement. So we're going to see that as we jump into it here. So Peter, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Blessed be the God and Father. It's, you know, Peter's just saying, man, praise the Lord for what he's done. That's really what he's saying. That he has begotten us again to a living hope. We, we have a living hope. We know that, you know, as bad as it gets and the worst it could even ever get, it doesn't really matter in the end because we've got a living hope. You know, we, we were talking yesterday in our uh, staff meeting as pastors, we were talking about um, just, you know, the suffering that's going on in the body these days. A lot of people suffering in a lot of different ways. And uh, we're talking about how some people are really struggling with the suffering. They just, you know, they can't understand why God's not coming through, it seems. He's not, you know, delivering them from their uh, predicament or he's not healing their bodies. And, um, you know, of course, there's a temptation to just sort of get angry with God. And as as we were talking about that and we were just encouraging one another as the pastoral staff, you know, to be patient with people and to just persevere in prayer and just be compassionate and all that. But, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking about the perspective. And as we we said last week when we were closing our study, um, this epistle and the the Bible itself, really, I think, in in its entirety, it really is always focused focusing us on eternity. It's reminding us that this is a temporal situation here. It's a temporal situation. And so I was thinking of what Paul said, that the sufferings of the present time cannot be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And you know, what Paul was talking about there is he's talking about the worst possible situation as bad as it could possibly get here on earth, it cannot compare with the glory that's going to come. And, you know, sometimes we, we hear about people who are just going through horrific kinds of circumstances, just unbelievable. And it doesn't seem like there's any relief. It doesn't seem like there's any deliverance. And yet we just have to remember, you know, one day, All of that is just going to be obliterated from memory, and there is going to be a glory. There is going to be something that is so awesome that it is indescribable for us today. It really is. It's indescribable. Peter's just filled with excitement blessing God, praising God that he has begotten us again to a living hope. We have an eternity with the Lord. 
that is awaiting us. And he gives a little bit of a description of it here to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. So this is what the Lord has begotten us to. He's begotten us to this living hope, to this inheritance that is incorruptible. It's undefiled. It'll never fade away. You know, you might be uh, here on earth, you might be an extremely wealthy, prosperous person, but you know, that wealth can fade away really quickly. It can be easily corrupted. You think of what, what's happened over the past year or so with our economy. And you think of um, you know, the investments that so many people have made. And, and, and all of a sudden, uh, through no fault of their own, it just everything's gone. It's, it's just it, uh, it was corruptible. It, it didn't last. And that's just the nature of life here in this world. But we have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled. It will never fade away. And it's waiting in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now remember, Peter's writing to people that are suffering. And it, the particular context really is more persecution than just sort of general suffering. General suffering, uh, of course, we can find application for general sufferings, but more specifically, he's writing to people that were being persecuted. And as a result of their persecution, they were um, being discriminated against. They were uh, losing their earthly goods in some cases. In other cases, they were... Uh, being cast into prison, they were being um, uh, beaten, maybe tortured, and in you know extreme cases, they were even uh, being executed. So th this is what's happening. So he's he's writing to them about eternity. He's writing to them about the things that that God has. Um, they're waiting for us, and he reminds them and us that we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, God's the one who holds us up. God's the one who, he keeps us going through the challenging times. Now, he talks about the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. And the salvation, he's, he's using the word salvation here in, um, in the sense of deliverance. So the promise that there is an end to the suffering, there is an end to the affliction, there is an end to the persecution, there's, there's a coming day of deliverance. And, you know, whether it come in the time that we hope it will come or not, uh, that's a, another story because God's got the whole time thing in his hand. But what we do know is it will come it will ultimately come. And all of this will fade away. And as we read there in Revelation chapter 21, that God is gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. I'm gonna preach on that this Sunday morning. A new heaven and a new earth. And there's gonna be no more crying. There's gonna be no more sorrow. There's gonna be no more pain. There's gonna be no more death for the former things have passed away. And again, Peter's talking about that here. But now, listen to what he says in verse 6. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. In this you greatly rejoice. In what? In this inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, that's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. It's in this that you greatly rejoice. You see, it's going to be difficult at times to rejoice in our present circumstances. What Peter's reminding us to do is look beyond your present situation and look to the future. Look to the promise of God. Look to what the Lord has in store for us. And you know, again, it's something that really is 
to some extent, it's beyond our comprehension. It's like Paul said to the Corinthians, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of a man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But we, they, those things have been revealed to us slightly by the Spirit. I'm sure that many of you have had those, those moments, and sometimes they're, um, you know, they're just a flash. But you, you, know, you hear, you hear the, the term, you know, a flash of brilliance. You know, somebody just all of a sudden, there's something that's, whoa. And it, it's kind of like that. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just give us a flash, just a, a, a real quick sense of, of the future, of eternity, of deliverance, of that hope. The Holy Spirit reminds us of that. But generally speaking, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It hasn't really entered into our hearts. But he's telling us this is what we are to be rejoicing in. That I'm going to heaven, ultimately. I'm going to be with the Lord. You know, guys, the older we get, the closer we get. You know? And, you, you know, you realize that when you look around and you know, your friends aren't there any longer because they've, they've gone already. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, a guy that I, I grew up with and had the privilege of finally leading him to the Lord after about 20 plus years of, of witnessing to him. And he ended up uh, working around here for a few years, but him and his wife, they packed up about a year ago and they moved back to the Midwest. And uh, they moved to Michigan originally, I think, or... Illinois or somewhere like that, but th then they ended up in Kentucky, and that's where they are right now. And um, at a, you know, strangely, this this friend of mine had two brothers, and we all kind of grew up together, so I knew the brothers really well. And he hasn't had any contact with them for years. I mean, they literally lost contact about fifteen to twenty years ago. And um, but you know, him and I would talk occasionally, and we'd kind of you know, reminisce about the guys and wonder what they're doing and so forth. So he ends up in this little town in Kentucky. And um, lo and behold, it's the same town that his brothers had moved to uh, a few years back. So he found out about it and he started, um, you know, he started looking for him. And he was looking for his younger brother, first of all, Greg. And he called me last week and he said, well, I found Greg. And uh, he's been dead for about a year. And I said, wow, you know, that, uh, unbelievable. You know, I just, I remember when we were teenagers. I remember when we were surfing together. I remember when we were partying together and, you know, all the stuff that we did back in those days. And so we talked for a few minutes and he said, yeah, you know, I'm looking for David and I, I think I got an address for him and I'm, you know, I'll let you know what happens in a couple of days. So I get a call from him a couple of days later. He says, yeah, I found David. Yeah, he's, he's been dead about four years. And, you know, I'm just like, wow, amazing. You know, these guys are just in their early 50s. But you know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, life is, is uh, moving on. And eternity is getting closer and closer. But for us, that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Because we've got an inheritance that's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's never going to fade away. It's waiting in heaven for us. And whatever's happening here on earth that's what I'm to really fix my focus on. That's what I'm to set my heart on. I am to rejoice in that fact. I am going to heaven. I'm going to be with the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord. And it's going to be a glorious thing. So in this you greatly rejoice. Listen to this. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Do you hear what he said? If need be. Now, if you ask me if I needed to be grieved by various trials, I would tell you no. <laughs> Never. Absolutely not. But, you know, isn't it true and isn't it interesting how trials have a way of doing something in us that really nothing else can do? They really have a way of, of refining us and, and purifying our hearts and, you know, driving us. They just have a way of driving us close to the Lord and getting us 
into that place of, of clinging to him. And so although, you know, in one sense, we, we want to avoid trials as much as we possibly can. We, wanna, we want them to stay as far away from us as is um, possible. Yet God knows that we need him. Because the trials are the tools that God uses to conform us to the image of Christ and to draw us nearer to himself. You know, as we've been praying um, for this little girl, Daisy. Daisy Love Merrick, and she's the daughter of uh, a good friend of ours, Britt Merrick. And um, Britt, last Sunday, they just, you know, they found out just uh, three or four days earlier about this cancerous tumor and, you know, this, this, just this horrific situation for Daisy. And, um, you know, the prognosis, you know, it's, it's a very challenging prognosis. She has stage three cancer and it has gone into a, a part of the lymph system and, you know, she's five years old. But anyway, last Sunday morning, uh, Britt, I was pretty astounded that he did it, but he, but he got up in front of his church and he preached. And, his message was entitled, When My Heart is Overwhelmed. And I, lit, I watched that message. And man, I'll tell you, it was gut-wrenching, you know, to just watch him up there, just falling apart, you know, really, to some extent. But then to see him regroup and be able to talk about the comfort and the grace of God and the peace. and um, But then to also talk about, you know, how just in the last few days, how the Lord had been bringing him closer and, and you know, forcing him to, to cling to God in ways that he had never really done up until that point. And that's what happens. That's what happens. And so even though it doesn't seem like it's ever a necessary thing, it is a necessary thing. But remember this. Trials are temporary. They don't last forever. If for a little while, if need be. I love that part, the little while. It just reminds us that there's an end to these things. That there's an end to the troubles. And that it won't always be uh, as dark as it is. You know, um, last year, I... I I won't mention the person by name. I don't want to embarrass them. But uh, last year, just about a year ago, uh, a, a guy in the church here, a great guy, was just having a real difficult time. And he ended up in the hospital. And he was really, really having a rough season. And I went to see him. And we talked a lot. And we prayed a lot. And, you know, he was in such a pit at the time. He, could not, he couldn't see any way out of it. He just thought, you know, there's no way out. There's no way... There's no hope. There's no, there's no deliverance from this. It's just, you know, kind of like I'm stuck here forever. And I just said to him, I said, you know what? The Lord is with you. He's going to pull you out of this thing. And I said this to him. I said, I said, a year from now, you're going to look back and say, man, I cannot believe what God has done. And, you know, I saw him uh, about a week ago. And I said, I said, wasn't it just about a year ago that you were in the hospital and I was visiting you? And he said, yeah, almost to the day. And I said, man, look at what the Lord has done. Look how the Lord has pulled you out of that pit and he's raised you up. And, you know, you still got some struggles like we all do, but just such a radical difference. And that's what God does. Because the trials come for a purpose. And when they accomplish the purpose, the purpose of purification, the purpose of uh, refining us, the purpose of drawing us closer into fellowship with God, when they accomplish those things, then they pass. That's what he encourages us with here. But listen to what he says in verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is is the most valuable thing in all of the universe as far as God is concerned. Your faith is much more precious than gold. Now, we put a high 
value.